pleasure to be here and to uh, get to know your, your campus and your town a little bit. One of my favorite things is going to uh, a city that I'm not familiar with and just seeing what's there and getting to understand where it came from and why it might look like that. Um, and who knows you know, what, what, what will come of that. But it's a fascinating research uh, uh, that I always enjoy doing. So I've been driving around uh, uh, Porterville a bit. Um, I am uh, going to be talking tonight about California as a muse. Uh, California as an inspiration for some very talented architects who therefore created some really extraordinary architecture, very distinctive architecture uh, here in California. Um, and I have kind of taken this on as something of a, uh, a, a crusade of my own because I found that um, a lot of people outside California, especially on the East Coast, which is kind of the power center of architecture and uh, uh, historical research and publication, they didn't always bother to come out and see what was going on here in California. Uh, and so in the history books, California often gets short shrift, which I do not think is justified at all. The sad part, however, is when Californians ourselves adopt that attitude and say, oh, well, if a New York critic didn't really like this building, then it must not be good. Um, and I find that much too often, uh, frankly, because I feel in my research and study, if you start looking at these buildings, and we're going to be talking about you know, gas stations, and we're going to be talking about coffee shops, and drive-in restaurants, and tract homes, these modest types of architecture, but which are really often well-designed, have a real purpose that solves specific problems in ingenious ways. And yet, if you didn't kind of live in California, if you didn't grow up in it, if you didn't kind of understand where these buildings came from, you might not really appreciate them. But I, part of my effort, my crusade these days, is to help uh, us Californians be proud of what we have. It is distinctive. It is different than the modern architecture from other parts of the world. And there's great modern architecture in, in Brazil, in, in Europe, certainly in Japan, uh, South America, um, uh, on the East Coast, in Chicago, uh, but, uh, and I'm not putting any of that down, but I think we as Californians can really come to the point where we have some, realize that we have something very distinctive. This first slide has nothing to do with my talk, uh, but I would like to mention that why don't we have cars that are as colorful as this today? <laughs> Why is every car black, white, or gray? I, I, I don't get that, but that's another, another lecture. Um, I'm going to kind of frame this around uh, a number of examples of uh, probably well-known recent buildings here in California, which were designed by people, architects, from outside of California. And I'm going to contrast that with a number of examples of buildings by architects who are working inside California and try to point out, in my opinion anyway, that the best architecture is the architecture which responds to the site, to the place, to the people, to the lifestyle. And so if you're going to do that, you need to understand the site, the climate, the people, the lifestyle that they're, 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 they're living. Um, <clears throat> that doesn't always happen. And unfortunately, a lot of these very well-known architects, like, say, Richard Meyer, who designed the Getty Center, uh, which you see here, which is what the Anthropology Club uh, visited uh, fairly recently. Um, he's a New York-based architect. He's a very good architect. Uh, <clears throat> but when he came to the Getty Center, he leaves certain things out. And it's telling in this right-hand slide. If your building has to have a written sign saying where the restrooms, telephone, and water fountain are, then you aren't taking advantage of architecture, which itself tells the story of where do you go, where's the entry, you know, where are the functional things that I need. So as beautiful as the Getty Center is, 
there are these kind of <coughs> shortcomings in it. Same thing with this, which is under construction now up in Silicon Valley. This is the new Apple headquarters, um, which was designed by Sir Norman Foster, a British architect, very distinguished, has done a number of excellent things. But it also has a number of, of drawbacks. The, the, that big circle that you see uh, is the width of the Pentagon. The Pentagon is one of the largest office buildings in the world. And so imagine somebody on the right-hand side trying to get to a department over on the left-hand side. You know, what do they do? What are they going to have to do? What are the functional qualities of it? It's an amazing building. It's like a spaceship, obviously. And you know, anybody who has an iPhone knows that Apple is very much into design. But there are these aspects of uh, the architecture and how it's used. And specifically, in this case, how the high-tech research campus which has evolved in Silicon Valley, um, has certain lessons, certain truisms that it developed, which this building completely ignores. Now, modern architecture is often narrowly defined as what we generally call the international style. These are a couple of examples. At the top is a design from 1914 by Walter Gropius of a factory. But it embodies what we think of as the international style. Very uh, rectilinear, flat roof, glass, steel, uh, abstract. No, no columns, no Gothic arches in it. A modern building for the modern age for a modern factory. An example, uh, a few years from 50 years later, is the uh, Crown Zellerback building in San Francisco, Market Street, by Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill, which you see there on the right. Same as aesthetic. But this is the international style as it came to really dominate what modern architecture is all about. But it is not what modern architecture is all about. Now to come to California. Uh, this is the Pasadena City Hall, uh, which is a Beaux-Arts style building. It's a classical style building. It has a dome like St. Peter's in Rome, for example. Uh, and it has tile roofs like the Missions. But also notice there on the right, these gardens, these open plazas, which are part of the building and part of the daily life of the workers and the citizens who come there to pay their bills or check on their building permits or whatever. Why is that there? Because this is California. You can live outside most of the year. Notice the great dome there at the top. It isn't enclosed. It's open air. Uh, just uh, uh, it's a major symbol of Pasadena in Southern California and showing that we live outside. We have the most beautiful climate in the world and the most beautiful views uh, as well, which you can see from the top of this dome. Why not have the architecture express that, make that available to the people who are using this building? Another example of this <coughs> is Union Station in Los Angeles, seen here from 1939. It was the last of the great railroad stations to be built in the United States. Um, then came World War II, and then came the jet plane. And that changed transportation forever. So you're not going to get a, 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 a train station like this after 1939. But look what it is. It is uh, uh, has a, it's reference to the, um, the Spanish missions of California. It has this tower. It has these large uh, vaulted areas, um, these arcades, etc. Uh, all of these things picking up on the local flavor, the local history, and the local lifestyle, the indoor-outdoor lifestyle, and using it to create a major civic monument. Now this attitude, again going back to this idea of California's muse, when architects came, either born here or came from elsewhere, they engaged in California. They engaged in what the lifestyle was here, what the climate was. For example, uh, the firm of Henry Hobson Richardson designed Trinity uh, Church on the top there in Boston. It is one of the great pieces of architecture in, uh, in the United States. It was from the um, uh, 1880s. Well, Henry Hobson Richardson died early, very young, 
but his successor firm was Shepley, Rutan, and Coolidge. And they came out in the 1880s to Palo Alto to build Stanford University, which you see on the bottom there. So from the East Coast, they came out here, but look at how they changed, how they transformed their architecture from what was appropriate in, the, in Boston to what was appropriate in California. So you get these massive walls uh, which absorb the hot sun. You get these arcades, so you get shadows which allow you to walk along in a shaded area but also protect those walls from getting the direct sunlight. And then you have these open plazas as well. So Shepley, Rutan, and Coolidge is one of the very first examples of an architect from someplace else who let themselves be influenced by California and what was here. Here are a couple of those uh, uh, arcades in uh, Stanford as well. The integration of landscaping by the great landscape architect um, uh, Olmsted, Frederick Law Olmsted as well, still an integral part of these buildings. There are a number of other architects who were born elsewhere and migrated to California, but who then were inspired to create something entirely new, entirely modern for the period. This is, for example, the Gamble House in Pasadena by two brothers, uh, the Green brothers, um, who transformed the modern house. Before that, the house was very um, square, four square, symmetrical usually. It was you know, either Gothic or maybe it was classical or maybe it was colonial style. But for California in 1908, they reconfigured, turned the house inside out, literally. For example, on the far right side there are sleeping porches. So the, the bedrooms were outside because of the wonderful weather of the uh, San Gabriel Valley. And then they, they sheathed it not in marble or, or, um, or stone or brick, but in simple unpainted shingles, wood shingles, kind you might put on a shack. But for the Gambles, and that's Procter and Gamble, these were very wealthy people, and they uh, vacationed out here in, uh, in Pasadena and had this house built for them. Um, but they didn't want pretension. They didn't want something monumental. They wanted something simple that fitted into the open air lifestyle and the natural beauty of the Arroyo in, San, in Pasadena. Another example up in the Bay Area, Saratoga. This is by Julia Morgan. Uh, same era as the Green Brothers. And you see the same lack of pretension, same simplicity. The same openness to nature. Uh, notice the trellis over the front door on the left-hand side. Uh, so they were involving nature in the, the building and the life of the people uh, of this. And, and Julia Morgan, great architect, probably the best known example is, uh, is San Simeon, William Randolph Hearst's castle out on the coast here. Uh, she, over a period of 20, some 20 or 30 years she built that with Hearst. Uh, but this is a more modest building that she built. Or one of my favorite buildings anywhere. This is the Christian Science Church in Berkeley by Bernard Maybeck. Also the same era as the Green Brothers and Julia Morgan as well. This is just a strikingly modern building. Maybeck was born in uh, New York, worked in Florida and then came to California and just reveled in the freedom that California allowed him. There weren't any rules. Back east, if you'd worked in New York, there are very strict rules about what a proper building would look like. It would have to be of certain style, um, and you would have to follow the rules of that certain style. Here in California, Maybach, who was, he was, uh, just a, a, a very creative person. He, he, he designed his own smocks to wear, and he had a wore a gray, a big beard, uh, and he put on plays for the neighbors. I mean, he was a very creative person all the way around. Uh, but in this building, he combined a number of things, the arts and crafts, simplicity of the construction, with the shapes of a Japanese temple. California has always been influenced by uh, the Orient. And then these Gothic elements around the window, especially. 
And then look at those windows down on the, the bottom, uh, the first floor as well. Those are factory sash metal windows, the kind of windows you would find in a factory in this period. And he brings them into a church, one of the most you know, proper, sacred, uh, inspirational sorts of buildings. Maybeck figured out a way to bring the modern era and the modern materials like those factory sash windows into a, just an extraordinary uh, building. This is the interior of it. Uh, concrete uses concrete, a, a new material. We've been talking a bit about that. And wood, and you see the quality of the light and the color. And then the simplicity, almost a, simpl a barn-like simplicity in some elements. So he's bringing together all of these elements. And California is letting him. Nobody is saying, don't do it. Because we were 3,000 miles from the, uh, the centers of criticism and, and academia at that time. And look at the freedom that Maybach, born in New York, coming to California, suddenly was able to use. Or down in San Diego, Irving Gill, who was also of this uh, period. And uh, he was interested in concrete, concrete construction which requires a certain simplicity. I mean, it's a massive, this is poured concrete, heavy, and difficult to work with. But he created, for example, these, these, beautiful arch, these beautiful arches. They were poured flat on the ground in frames, and then they were tilted up. But notice the simplicity of them. Through the uh, left-hand arch there, you see another of his buildings. This was a, uh, a building for Mrs. Scripps. Um, it, a very wealthy lady who became one of his major patrons, uh, not only of him, but of the arts and architecture in general in Southern California. Notice the similarity here. This is a, a, one of the California missions, and there you see those same arches that Gill is using. He knew the history of California. He knew the missions. He used those elements, the thickness, the, the, the re repetition, and he translated it in, into a modern architecture. He came to California, he saw what was here, he was inspired by it, and he did something new and extraordinary, which still inspires architects today. This is a, a complex of, of townhomes, connected townhomes in Santa Monica um, that uh, Gill designed. You see the arches, you see the simple forms. This is also concrete inside and out. So he is using modern technology, and he is integrating it with the sense of the place, the indoor-outdoor lifestyle, and the history to create something unique to California. Now, we can take that interest also in new materials, new um, uh, the, the local history, into the work up in the 1960s and 70s of Charles Moore, uh, a great architect uh, at both the um, uh, the Santa Barbara Faculty Club at the bottom, and the Leland Burns House. Leland Burns was a planning professor at UCLA. But in the forms, you see an abstracted use of those historical elements, uh, the, the arches. But they're, they're changed, obviously, or the, um, uh, the tile roofs, but changed a bit. And in the Lee Burns house at the top, the colors, the vibrant colors in the California light. How can you use that? Well, this is one way that you can use it. So you have these uh, architects coming to California, being inspired by what is here to create something new. Now, I mentioned earlier concrete. Concrete is a very interesting material. It was a very modern material at the time. And uh, California architects used it freely in a number of different ways. So this is the uh, uh, Lovell House in Newport Beach by Rudolf Schindler as well. And what you can see is one, two, three, four, five of these big structural bents. They almost, I mean, they were massive enough to like support a, a freeway overpass of some sort. But then he carves them out to create this interior space through the house um, to mate modern materials with uh, uh, modern lifestyle. This, that big window there, for example, looks directly out of the ocean as well. And it's raised so that you can see out. Uh, another example of the use of concrete is this. This is the Oasis Hotel from 1925 in Palm Springs. This is by <clears throat> Lloyd Wright, the son 
of Frank Lloyd Wright. And Lloyd Wright was a, uh, a Southern California architect. See all those horizontal lines? That is an expression of the concrete construction. This is what is called slip form construction. So they would uh, build a form about a foot high around the entire exterior of the building, pour concrete in it, let it harden, and then they would slip the wood form up one level, pour another layer of concrete, let it sit, and then take the same form, slip it up. That's why you get these horizontal lines, which become a distinctive part of the architecture. But then at the top, notice, uses these uh, carved uh, ornamental elements, which echo the textures of the mountain behind it. Taking the building and putting it in its place and letting the place reflect, be reflected in the architecture. Or this is one of my favorite buildings. This is also uh, at the bottom here, the house for the silent screen star Ramon Navarro, also by Lloyd Wright. The dark uh, uh, decorative elements are actually green, uh, a copper. But notice how it sits into the Hollywood. This is in the Hollywood Hills. Now, this area today is you know, jammed with houses and trees and so forth. But this is what it looked like in the 1920s. And Lloyd Wright creates this bridge across a ravine for this house. Or this concrete house by uh, Rudolf Schindler, uh, an Austrian who came to work with Frank Lloyd Wright and then ended up in Los Angeles as well. Also, tilt-up concrete construction. See, each of these panels is one panel formed flat on the ground and then tilted up. And they are at an angle, so it has kind of a, I don't know, an Egyptian character. But around these walls, you have these indoor-outdoor spaces. Literally, the indoor rooms, living rooms, flow right out outside. And they had Thanksgiving there, and they ate outside there. That's Schindler on the, uh, the left-hand side, lying down, uh, looking at his son um, on, on the ground. What is this all about? This is about California, a beautiful climate, and creating an architecture that will respond to that, to allow people to enjoy the landscape. Well, that is a fact of California architecture, which has continued in many ways uh, all through the decades. This is a house by Cliff May from the 1950s. But again, you have the same idea, the flow of space from indoors to outside, living outside, partying outside. Uh, a constant in California architecture, shaping the architecture. I have to throw in a couple of other buildings here. This is a Hangover House in South Laguna Beach, up on a cliff, concrete indoors and outdoors in a striking site overlooking the ocean as well. But the idea of using this much concrete, both inside and outside, concrete is hard to work with. How do you finish that off, both inside and outside? Let's see, I think I have a slide. Here's the inside. So you can see the board forms in the walls inside, but they are so beautifully done, and still in, this is 1938, this house, still in excellent condition. Um, so um, uh, again, California architects using, this is Alexander uh, Levy, who's the architect of this, and um, a, a, using a modern material in an entirely new and creative way. Or coming up into the 1960s, <clears throat> this is the uh, Sheets Goldstein House by John Lautner. John Lautner, uh, the student of Frank Lloyd Wright's. Um, this house was just recently, you may have read, uh, given to the, uh, uh, the LA County Museum of Art, which will now own it. But it's concrete. Notice the triangulated trusses uh, and coffers inside, and the large glass window. Uh, out to the pool and a beautiful view of the downtown Beverly Hills. Concrete being used in new and different ways. California is amused. The, the climate, the culture, the freedom, the, 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 the landscape itself is, has been amused to these extremely talented architects. For example, Frank Lloyd Wright. On the left is the uh, Willits House in suburban Chicago by Frank Lloyd Wright. This is generally acknowledged to be the very first prairie house design to be 
completed by Frank Lloyd Wright. And it revolutionized architecture, the simplicity of it, the expression of the, uh, the rectilinear wood framework. That was 1904, I believe. Then Cal uh, Frank Lloyd Wright comes to California in the late teens and early 20s. He's, well, he's almost thrown out of Chicago because there were scandals about his life and you know, there was a fire at his house that, and the murdered uh, mistress and so forth, very ugly. So he escaped, came out to California. And what was he building there? He was building things like the Millard House there on the right. Concrete, concrete block in this case. But look at how he is responding to an entirely different site, entirely different construction method in an entirely different way. He allowed what, what I mean, frankly right, was brilliant of course, he could have done anything anywhere, but he responded to the site and to nature at that site to reinvent, literally reinvent his entire architecture. Or another example, uh, this is Albert Frey. Albert Frey was born in Switzerland and always had a fascination with the United States. In the uh, architecture office he worked at, he was known as the American, even though he'd never been to America at that point. He worked with some of the very best architects of the period, Le Corbusier for example, whose uh, Villa Savoie, which you see on the left-hand side there, is a, an icon of modern architecture. It's simplicity, the way it rises above the ground. Uh, Albert Frey worked on that house. But then he came out to the California desert in the early 1930s. And what you see on the right is his own house that he built for himself. And it is not Corbusier. He, was, he learned from Corbusier, but then coming to the desert, fell in love with the desert and the colors. Look at the colors of those fiberglass uh, elements and look, look at the pink colors. Those are all derived from the desert, from the colors of the, the flora and the fauna, uh, but it's still a modern building because it's steel and glass, indoor, outdoor, you see the pool there. I love the uh, concrete chaise longes here that he builds into the patio for the use of uh, his guests. Los Angeles was at this time in the 20s and 30s becoming a city of the automobile. A new way of transportation, a new way of getting around uh, cities, and the city had to respond. So you have buildings like on the left there from 1928, Bullock's Wilshire by Parkinson and Parkinson, which is not downtown, all of, you know, all the big department stores were downtown. You had to go downtown Los Angeles to do all your shopping. Suddenly this idea is, well, we're liberated from downtown. We've got cars. We can drive out Wilshire Boulevard and go to an uh, extremely beautiful, fancy, upscale department store like Bullock's Wilshire. And so a new form needed to be created for it with the tower so that you could see it as you approached on Wilshire, parking at the rear, and uh, some beautiful details. This is, again, copper detailing uh, with this very original, modern <coughs> detail uh, on, the, uh, on, on the top of the tower. Edward Durrell Stone was another architect from Arkansas. Got a start in New York City. Became famous in uh, the 1950s for the United States Embassy in New Delhi, which you see at the top. Very interesting building, uh, again, responding to the climate because you have the, the open screen work to allow air to flow through. But when he came out to California, he again didn't maintain that formality of the embassy, but he made something more simple, more suburban, like the Palo Alto City Library on the left hand, lower left hand side there or a factory. On the right is the Stewart Pharmaceutical Factory. That's a factory building that he designed also in Pasadena. Something new for a new place. Or Stanford Hospital, also by Edward Durrell Stone. And <clears throat> I particularly like the lower left-hand corner, this screen wall, concrete block, which completely disrupts your idea of what's inside and what's outside. We're standing outside but we walk through this screen wall into the outside again, into a beautiful garden, which you see in the upper left-hand corner there, uh, designed by Thomas Church, one of the great 
modern landscape architects. Many of these architects coming to California, whether they were born here or they came here, were looking around. Architects, good architects, have good eyes. They scan the landscape, look for new ideas, something to inspire them. And the vernacular buildings, the buildings of the natural uh, or of the, the native landscape, are often some of the most original, direct, and striking examples that they would look at. We already looked at the existing Spanish missions in the upper left-hand corner. But then there were industrial buildings, like the Monterey Canning Company in Monterey. Or simple apartment houses, this style is called a dingbat apartment house. It's lifted up off the ground, you park underneath, but it's a square stucco box. You see them all over the place in Los Angeles and in the Bay Area as well. So keep that in mind. In the lower left-hand corner, a ranch house, very simple ranch house as well. Or the commercial vernacular of car washes from the 1950s, responding to the way people were living with their automobile. These are all vernacular designs, uh, uh, fairly functional, fairly direct, responding to a problem, and yet having in them a, a, a kernel of, a, of an idea, a concept, which architects would notice. For example, that big bad apartment house in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, compare that to an early design for an artist studio by Frank Gehry on the right-hand side. This is the Lou Danziger art studio. Just a regular vernacular Los Angeles stucco box. Nothing pretentious about it at all. And yet the way Gary deals with it here very early in his career, he makes art out of it. We say other architects <coughs> using shingles, uh, using simple forms, uh, whether it's William Worcester at a uh, uh, seaside ho house in the upper left-hand corner in Marin County, or a church by Warren Callister in the lower right-hand corner, or the, uh, the, the ranch houses. The haciendas, stucco haciendas of California. You see an example of drawing in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, this is a hacienda uh, built in what is now uh, one of the Marine Corps bases in Southern California. Cliff May grew up living in houses like this. His family owned these houses. So when he became an architect and started designing ranch houses, he took those memories of those Spanish adobe haciendas and brought them into his houses. This is a very early one. You see the obvious relationship between this building and this building with the tile roofs. But then as he modernizes it for a prefabricated house here in uh, Long Beach, um, it becomes still indoor, outdoor, simple, more glass as possible, and um, the, uh, the connection between uh, indoor living rooms and outdoor living rooms becomes complete. He begins to abstract that then in this later modernized house. You see the connection, the roofs, the plain stucco walls, but it's been modernized, been transformed. Or the Gregory Farmhouse, another ranch house uh, by William Wilson Worcester, for example. It looks like it could have just been thrown up by some farm ranch hands. Uh, it's that simple, and yet it is designed really exquisitely well in terms of the plan and the details and the proportions. Well, those were custom homes, but that same idea of a plain vernacular ranch house was then transformed into what we now call the mass-produced ranch house, uh, and it was translated into an assembly line process, and this is what housed Californians, really people all across the country as well, figuring out how to build a simple, affordable, appealing house for the masses like you would an automobile. So on the site, they have a crew come through and do all of the, uh, the concrete slabs. Another crew would come through then and build the wood walls. Another crew would come in and do the plumbing and the roofing and the finishes and so forth until you had, on a mass basis, a modern, affordable house, like you see in these, uh, behind, in this slide. Uh, 
You see these all over California. And we kind of dismiss them. I mean, they're, they're everywhere. And yet, when you think about the process by which so many of these came to be, to house so many people, to solve a housing crisis, they are really a remarkable uh, invention. And they could often be quite architectural as well. This is a track house by uh, Smith and Williams, uh, uh, Pasadena, very noted Pasadena architects, who felt that the trying to solve the problem of mass-produced housing, decent mass-produced housing, was worthy of them. They didn't have to design houses for wealthy people to really express their architectural talent. They could do the same thing for the buildings for average people. And again, this is something which California um, uh, uh, really specialized in, in creating modern architecture, especially for suburbia. The plan of Los Angeles, of San Jose, um, of, uh, of, of uh, Bakersfield and Fresno, uh, especially after World War II, became this uh, large, decentralized, multi-centered city. And uh, here's, uh, you know, a lot of it looked like this. Uh, lanes of traffic, a lot of cars, uh, telephone poles, commercial buildings, signs. But notice what kinds of signs. I mean, this is what critics, especially from the East Coast coming out here, would say, my god, this is a mess. This is so random. It's, it's, it's chaotic. And in fact, and this is something that really Californians only understood, there is an order. There is a sensibility about this. Notice, for example, two unmistakable elements, the rocket and the donut. You, you, you have to all have seen those. What is that about? That is creating an image in architecture of a certain scale so that it was, it, uh, could be seen and was unignorable, in fact, through the windshield of the car. It was a way to organize this large, spread out city. So that you would know, you know, you want a donut? Okay, where do you turn in? Oh, over there. It's just that simple. And it is a solution which was used quite a lot. Uh, the, the Brown Derby at the bottom is an example from the 1920s of the same idea, creating a building which was a sign that drew you in. Or out here in the valley, certainly, Coming up and down uh, Route 99, there used to be a lot of these giant oranges as well on the roadside, bringing people in uh, for a, uh, a rest stop. But it didn't just have to be that. It didn't have to be just a giant hat or an orange or something. It could be modern architecture. This is a market from 1926 by Lloyd Wright, again, who we met earlier. And notice how on the left is that tower. Notice at night how it is illuminated all the way around, what's that for? It's to create a, a, a magnet, a visual magnet to draw your eye. This is where the market was. It was quite clear. This is where you park, right in front. So there are these new rules about how to design modern architecture, which California architects, living with the automobile, living in our cities, learned. The result was drive-in restaurants, for example, like this, by Wayne McAllister, I notice again, small building, but a tall tower to give it presence. Or at night, look what happened to it as well. It was a building integrating lighting and architecture for the purpose of creating a landmark. Gotta throw in a couple of, these are buildings which are uh, called Googie architecture. I'll show you the, the original building which uh, inspired this. This was the Tiny Nailers at um, uh, Sunset and, um, and La Brea, now gone, like a rocket ship. Oh, this is Googies. They're on the right. Uh, this was designed by John Lautner. We saw the Sheets Goldstein house earlier. Uh, but notice how that angled roof comes up. It has a sign on it. And in all of this random chaos of the commercial strip, that draws your attention. It's designed to do so. And from the inside, you look out through large glass windows at the mountains beyond. Norms. This is Norms, uh, the original Norms, actually, on uh, Manchester at Figueroa. Um, 
and you see the same ideas. A sign, board, sign integrated into the architecture, a lot of glass so that people driving by, especially at night, could look in and see that oh, this, you know, a lot of people there, must be a good restaurant, let's pull in and have some food. And the upward cantilevered roof, all of these modern structural ideas scaled for the modern building. The original McDonald's uh, was exactly the same sensibility of architecture. Or behind Andy Warhol there on the Sunset Strip uh, is Ben Franks. And you can notice from the, this distinctive roof line of Ben Franks, the same principle at work, how to create memorability, a landmark, an image in the car culture. Or this uh, gas station, which was down by uh, Disneyland originally, no longer there, uh, by Smith and Williams uh, as well. Modern, using a single post, well, hold, held, holding up the, uh, the canopy on guy wires, and then flying above it all was this red Pegasus. Pegasus was, I guess still is, the, the corporate symbol of, of mobile. This one is special, however, because it was sculpted by Albert Stewart and Millard Sheets, two very well-known um, artists as well, who again did not see anything wrong with designing for a simple gas station. That's a very California attitude. Or billboards as well. This is Wilshire Boulevard in the 1920s. Look at all the billboards, simple billboards. In the 1950s, they became even more powerful and graphic. And so you have people like Richard Neutra integrating billboards into his buildings. This is for uh, uh, Universal Pictures, their office at the corner of Hollywood and Vine, as a matter of fact. And uh, Neutra uses billboards repetitive along the, uh, the parapet of the building. A vernacular element, a simple element, a commercial element used in the architecture of a very sophisticated architect. And you see this same idea of the billboard translated into architecture at supermarkets and at coffee shops as well here. The billboard is on end. And drive-in movie theaters as well, a common place at the time in the Southern California, in the California landscape. And how is that translated then? Well, in this series of home savings and loan buildings designed by Millard Sheets, the artist, we see these beautiful mosaic murals, which are literally like not just billboards, but drive-in movie screens depicting local characters, local history, etc. Just an extraordinary translation of these vernacular California landscape elements into architecture. Or Richard Neutra uh, taking the drive-in. This is a drive-in church. This is the Garden Grove Community Church, which Richard Neutra designed on the left there, where the preacher could actually speak either to the congregation inside or to the congregation in the parking lot, sitting in their cars just like they would at a drive-in movie theater. On the right is the Crystal Cathedral, which was added in 1980 by Philip Johnson to this uh, compound. California architecture is really about delight. In Europe, there was a certain kind of intellectual rigor or straitjacket or maybe hair shirt about modern architecture. It had to be, you know, like a factory, it had to be a machine for living in, um, which is fine to a point. California wasn't so concerned about it being so rigorous and more concerned about it being pleasurable. So whether it's Disneyland and what Mary Blair designed, or it's a small world, or Deborah Sussman at the 1984 um, 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 uh, Los Angeles Olympics in the lower left-hand side, or the nut tree up in Vacaville by uh, the architect for Blackford uh, as well. Color, light, a lot of different images all together, all really interesting and pleasurable. Or, uh, you know, you can, here's one of these, the car washes, again, expressing its structure just the way Charles Eames expressed the structure in his own house in Pacific Palisades. Different purposes, different forms, but the same idea. So, in creating this California landscape, we talk about this indoor-outdoor lifestyle. We talked about 
um, um, uh, Union, Union Station in Los Angeles with these outdoor patios. So when you get off the, the train coming in from Cincinnati or New York or Boston in the middle of the winter, you're suddenly outside in a garden in the sunlight when you step off in Los Angeles. Great sales point for, uh, for uh, moving here, obviously, but also integrated into the architecture. You see the same thing in public spaces in our early shopping centers as well. They were not just shopping centers, they were also communal places, social places, places for people to gather, beautifully landscaped. Or, and the same concepts were translated into our public buildings. This is an early sketch for the music center by Welton Beckett uh, on Bunker Hill in Los Angeles. But you see the same quality of a big box building and then these outdoor plazas and fountains. Or the LA County Museum of Art by William Pereira as well. Same concept. Why? Because this is the way Southern Californians learn to live socially, in public in these sorts of open terraces with art and fountains and sunlight and uh, their fellow citizens. That was entirely destroyed by a Philadelphia firm, Hardy Holzman Pfeiffer, on the upper right-hand corner then, uh, when they added the Anderson Wing to the LA County Museum. Before, you see it on the left, the way it was built, that open space was completely walled and blocked off by the Anderson Wing. They did not understand how Southern Californians live. The new Broad Museum by uh, Dillard Scafidio and Renfro, which you see on the right end there, just opened uh, last year on Bunker Hill. Well, it's, it's beautiful, it's gotten great reviews. But 30 years before, Edward Drill Stone in a bank building in Beverly Hills was creating the same sort of prefab, geometrically contorted, uh, and interesting facades as well. It had already been done here. The uh, De Young Museum uh, by Herzog, uh, Herzog uh, de Meuron, again, uh, uh, a European firm coming out to San Francisco, created this really you know, striking building, and yet it doesn't really fit. They did not try to adjust it to the California environment. On the lower side is the, the May Company building from 1939 by A.C. Martin. Uh, at the top, that big bulb you see, is what is now under construction. Again, by a European firm, uh, Renzo Piano, uh, as well. It's striking, it's extraordinary, it's eye-catching, and yet it has nothing to do with the original building. It has very little to do with Southern California. We talked already about the Apple uh, headquarters as well. Not really connecting itself to the lifestyle of Silicon Valley. And probably the worst of all is uh, this proposal on the left-hand side for the replacement for the LA County Museum of Art. Uh, this is by Peter Zumtor, who is a, a very good Swiss architect. But he's never done anything this size. He's never done anything in California. When he was trying to design this building on Wilshire Boulevard, in the midst of one of the richest neighborhoods in Los Angeles. He literally said in a public statement when the design was unveiled, he said, I became desperate. I didn't know what to do. And then he looked at his model and he saw the La Brea tar pits on the model right next door to the LA County Museum. And he said that's what gave him the idea for this kind of oozing amorphous form. Well, if that's as far as your imagination goes, if you don't understand enough about the history of California architecture to understand all the other sources that you could draw upon, and you come up with something like this. This is the danger of relying too much on architects who are imported from outside, who do not try to understand that California is a muse. California is something that will inspire you to great architecture. We have a lot of architects that are inspired in that way. Um, on the right, you see this Disney Hall by Frank Gehry. Notice how it relates to the curves of the music center in the left-hand slide uh, as well. So he understood the context. He responded to the context in an extremely creative way. So here in California, we have just uh, a, a lot of great original architecture. This is Marin County Civic Center, 
by Frank Lloyd Wright, a roadside suburban capital building for suburbia. The Capitol Records building in Hollywood, a circular office building, a new idea. Disneyland as well, one of the most influential master planned projects in the 20th century. Uh, Lloyd Wright's um, Wayfarer's Chapel in Palace Verde's Estates, a glass chapel set on the edge of the ocean, the Pacific Ocean. Western Village, an early planned community from the 1920s with a university at its core and a village of residential houses around it. We already saw John Lautner's concrete sheet school steam house. Ships Coffee shop in Westwood, a Googie coffee shop by uh, Martin Stern Jr. This is a house, these are all modern houses, but no, are all not modern build buildings, but notice the variety here in California. There's no one style that's modern. This in the middle here is a house by Wallace Neff for Groucho Marx as well. And notice how the, the curve, kind of whip line curve of the, uh, of the roof line matches the, uh, the car fins in his carport as well. Understood the car culture. So, to wrap up, California has architects who were born here, are native. We have Cal architects who were born elsewhere and moved here. The question is, how do they respond once they got here? Show me a number, number of examples where people ignored what was here and created not so successful buildings. But in something like Bernard Maybeck's Christian Science Church, we have the model, the DNA, for understanding how California itself, its culture, its history, its landscape, its people, can inspire great architecture. And this is what we should be seeking. This is what we should be demanding of our architects, especially for the, our major civic institutions that define who we are. We don't need to go elsewhere to find a good architect. We have them, and we have the inspiration for them right here. So California is a muse if we use her. So thank you very much. <laughs>